Thank you, President Tanko. Uh, and congratulations, Butler 2018. You have done it. Your friends are impressed. Your parents are proud. Your professors are shocked. <laughs> the first thing I should say to you is that uh, my own son went to Indiana University at Bloomington. Uh, and as your commencement speaker, I have important responsibilities. Commencement speakers tend to be pompous windbags, skilled at pretentious verbiage and meaningless rhetoric. I think your president made a very wise decision inviting someone whose primary loyalty is to IU. <laughs> uh, graduates, I feel I know you. To get into a place like Butler, you had to spend your high school years starting four companies, curing two formerly fatal diseases, participating in three obscure sports like fencing, planking, and snow volleyball. Since you got to Butler, you've mastered new skills. You learned how to dominate classroom discussion while doing none of the reading. Uh, in lecture halls, you mastered another skill. Right now, for example, it looks like you're staring at me with rapt attention. In fact, you're all fast asleep. I salute your community service. You spent your spring breaks unicycling across Thailand while reading to lepers. You tell your friends you like Chance the Rapper, but secretly you vote like Kanye West. <laughs> um, uh, now on this uh, big day, uh, your life takes an exciting turn. There are two paths ahead of you. One leads to a soul-crushing job as a cog in a corporate machine. The other leads to permanent residence in your parents' basement. <laughs> I'm here to help you navigate these exciting possibilities. <laughs> you may not have been to other college commencements, so you may not know the etiquette. After you get your degree, it's customary to give President Danko a little tip, just to show he did a good job. <laughs> 10 or 20 bucks is fine. It's customary to give the commencement speaker a little bit, five, five or 600. 5,000 for econ majors. Um, uh, this may be your first college commencement. You probably know these addresses have a certain formula. The school asks a person who has achieved a certain level of career success to give you a speech telling you career success is not important. Then we're supposed to give you a few minutes of completely garbage advice. Listen to your inner voice, be true to yourself, follow your passion, your future is limitless. First, my generation gives you a mountain of debt then we give you career derailing guidelines so that you will never pay it off. Uh, uh, <laughs> I've decided to use this commencement to try to cut through all that. And so I'm gonna try to tell you what's gonna happen to you over the next 20 years of your life. Uh, if you don't want to know how this thing called your life is going to turn out, pay less attention to me now over the next 10 minutes than you even are at this instant. <laughs> the first thing to say is that when you're in college, it's really hard to know what it's like after college. When you're a student, life is station to station. There's always the next assignment, the next test. Social life has its dramas, but at least it's laid out there in front of you in the dorms and the dining halls. After college, there are no more stations. You're thrown out into a borderless sea, expected to find your own career path, your own social tribe, your own beliefs, your own values, your own partners, your own viewpoints, your own identities. It takes a different set of navigational skills than you've ever had before to find the far horizon goals you'll orient your life to. You're at an inflection point of your life, and the hard part of an inflection point is that the skills required to get out of it are skills you do not yet possess. So you have to endure a meandering, wandering process between, say, ages 22 and 28 that will change who you are. You have to build your boat after you've been launched out to sea. The average American has seven jobs over the course of their 20s. Emerging adults move every three years. 40% of you will move back home with your parents. The future is hopeful, but the present will be marked by wandering doubt, loneliness, unemployment, heartbreaks, bad bosses, while your parents go slowly insane. <laughs> there are two common routes students take after graduation. 
The first is the aesthetic life. People who take this route figure they should have some fun before they settle into adulthood. These are the people who at age 23 go yak herding in Mongolia or teach whitewater rafting in Colorado. And this daring course has real advantages. Your first job out of college is probably going to suck anyway, so you might as well use this period to widen your horizon of risk. If you do something completely crazy now, forever after you'll be able to handle craziness. Furthermore, you'll build up what the writer Meg Jay calls identity capital. If at every job interview and every dinner party for the next 30 years, somebody's going to ask you what it was like to be a yak herder in Mongolia, and this will distinguish you from everybody else. This is a great way to start off adulthood. The problem comes is that the person who takes an aesthetic approach to life is concentrating on having a series of fun experiences but is not thinking about the grand project his or her life is building toward. It's a timeless truth that if you live life as a series of serial adventures, if you spend your life keeping your options open and not really committing to any one thing, you'll find yourself leading an impotent, fragmented life. Life will be a series of temporary moments, not an accumulating flow of accomplishments. You'll waste your powers, scattering them in all directions. The second group of emerging adults confront a borderless sea, and they figure they should treat the real world just as a continuation of school. As students, they were good in getting into places, so they try to get admitted into companies. As students, they liked having prestigious brand names like Butler, so they go off and find companies that have prestigious brand names. The problem with this way of life is that living as a pragmatic utilitarian turns you into a utilitarian pragmatist. The how to succeed questions quickly get eclipsed by the is this my life question and why am I doing this question. Suddenly your conversations consist mostly in describing how busy you are. Suddenly you're a chilly mortal going into hyper people pleasing mode anytime you're around your boss. It turns out the people in your workplace don't want you to have a deep fulfilling life. They want you to be a workaholic professional cog so they can have deep fulfilling lives. They give you gold stars of affirmation every time you mold yourself into the shrewd animal your workplace wants you to be. And workaholism is a surprisingly effective distraction from any emotional and spiritual problem. Pretty soon you're suffering from acedia. Acedia is an old-fashioned word for the quieting of desire. It's a lack of care, it's living the sort of life that doesn't arouse your strong passions and instills a sort of sluggishness of the soul. Your heart is over here, but your life is over there. So if, if you do this, you'll look around and you'll start asking yourself, what is my life for? You'll get depressed because you don't know what your purpose is. You'll doubt your own abilities. You'll feel like you're wasting your precious time. Other people are thriving, but you're stuck. You lose track of who you really are. As Lily Tomlin put it, when I was young, I always wanted to be somebody. Now I know I should have been more specific. <laughs> and so each of these two ways end up in the ditch. And my experience of life in the 20s these days is everybody winds up in the ditch. That's at one point or another. Now the first bit of good news is that everybody has to go through this process sometime. You might as well get it over with and not waste 25 or 50 years of your life in something that's not really you. A lot of people in their career put their ladder against the nearest wall and it's not till they're 60 they realize they put their ladder against the wrong wall. The second bit of good news is you don't have to come up with your one big epiphany to answer all of life's questions all at once. It's fine to bounce around. The third piece of good news is that the ditch, that lull you're going to go through sometime in the next 10 years, is a good thing. It's the only place you can kill your golem. Now what's a golem? He's a, the golem of self-regard. He's a little creature who looks like that guy in Harry Potter who asks questions like, how am I doing? How do I compare? What do people think of me? What do I think of myself? Am I impressing others? Over the years, your golem of self-regard has found out a specific way it wants you to be in order to win the most approval, what Henry Nouwen calls the ego ideal. The ego wants to point you to a life that'll make you seem smart, good-looking, and admirable. 
it's very likely you've already spent a lot of time conforming to your ego ideal. As the psychologist James Hollis puts it, your ego prefers certainty to uncertainty, predictability over surprise, clarity over ambiguity. Your ego wants you to choose a career that you can use as a magic wand to impress everybody else. The golem of self-regard wants you to have small, sort of mediocre pleasures, like having a nice house and being better than others. The golem of self-regard is the murderer of the big happiness, the joy that's really out there for you. The joy when you're enthralled by some academic discipline pursuing knowledge. The joy you get when you're on the front lines of social justice. The joy you get when you forget all about yourself because you're thinking about the specific student you're teaching, the specific patient you're treating, the specific client you're helping, your specific son and daughter. There is something inside you that will call your soul that is longing to give yourself away to lead a life your ego cannot even fathom. There's something in you that senses, as C.S. Lewis put it, the scent of a flower we have not yet found, the echo of a tune we have not yet heard, the news from a country we have never visited. It's only under the moments of suffering that you're desperate enough to leave behind the golem of self-regard. There are no shortcuts. There's just the same eternal three-step process that poets have described from the beginning of time, from suffering to discipline to wisdom, dying to the old self, cleansing in the emptiness, and resurrecting in the new. Until you kill the golem of self-regard, you're just performing your life. You're, not, you're just in show business. You're not really living your life. Social media is all about the golem of self-regard. Recovering from that ditch period you're going to go through is not like recovering from a disease. People don't come out healed, they come out different. The poet Ted Hughes observes that the things that are worst to undergo are the best to remember because at those low moments the protective shells are taken off, humility is achieved, and finally you can really be loved. When you have stripped off the golem of self-regard, you realize you're much better than your ego ideal. You get out of your own way, you ask the good questions like, what would I do if I weren't afraid? You throw away the bad questions, which is, what do I want from life? And you ask the true question, what does life want from me? What problem is around me that I can solve? You come to see that the question that leads to happiness is, how can I give myself away? What job or person or community or faith or cause can I pour myself into so thoroughly I'm no longer thinking about myself? Think about every movie you've ever watched. They're all about intensity. They're all about somebody who's so intensely committed to another person, a cause, a struggle against evil, they forgot about themselves. When you get out of school this afternoon, your freedom will feel like a vast, borderless ocean. And so for a while, it's right to say yes to everything. Then you go through the ditch, and then you plant yourself into something. Plant yourself into a specific institution, something with a name. It might be Butler University, the United States Marine Corps, a company you believe in, Archer Daniels Midland. When you serve an institution, you don't have a job, you have a vocation. The most famous saying about a vocation is Frederick Beekner's. It's where your deep gladness meets the world's deep need. The first part of finding a vacation is finding the things you are most motivated to do. I suspect most of the adults in this room will agree with me when I say life is not about talent. Life is about effort. It's about finding the thing you're willing to work ferociously hard at for decade after decade. And I mean a specific thing. The writer Annie Dillard once asked a friend how he knew he was meant to become a painter. And he said, I like the smell of paint. It wasn't some grandiose sense of his destiny. It was the physical presence of paint and his pleasure in it. My daughter loves being at hockey rinks, so she teaches hockey. Some people like writing code. My accountant loves plugging into numbers on the spreadsheets. Nietzsche had some good advice about this, how to find your vocation. Make a list of the four times you've been genuinely happy, and then see if you can draw a line through those four things. That's where your deep gladness is. Finding out what really motivates you is not like buying a car. It's not a decision. It's about listening to your own life, understanding your own desire. What do you do when nobody is telling you what to do? What do you read when nobody's telling you what to read? 
The second part of finding a vocation is finding a problem you love, some problem in the world. A social problem would seem like something you hate, but when you look at people who found a vocation who have really found fulfilling lives, it's more accurate to say they love a problem. I know a man in Washington who has spent his life trying to reform the way political campaigns are financed. He hates the way money corrupts politics, but he loves his problem. He spent his life devoted to his problem. Every day I get mass emails from him linking to some news story about his problem. I want to unsubscribe to his email list because it's clogging up my inbox, but I don't want to hurt his feelings because if I tell him I don't care about his problems, it'll be like telling him I don't really like his child. So the lesson is go around looking for problems. Thomas Bernard wrote, one's mind has to be a searching mind, a mind searching for mistakes for the mistakes of humanity, a mind searching for failure. I met a guy recently who was really bugged, spent his whole life bugged, that it still takes three minutes to toast a piece of bread. <laughs> he, spent it, he started a company to make a fast toaster, and the guy seemed completely fulfilled. <laughs> so finding your gladness and finding a problem. Now I'm going to end by trying to short circuit your search and tell you what I think the central challenge of your generation is. It's social fragmentation. It's isolation. It's the deterioration of the United States social fabric. You can tell a lot of good stories about America, about how innovative and rich we are, but our relationships are getting worse. Twice as many people say they are lonely as a generation ago. Suicide rates are at a 30 year high. Depression rates and mental health problems are rising, not falling. Social trust is plummeting. 55,000 Americans die every year from opiate addiction. We are less connected to one another. Ravines are opening up across class, politics, race, and geography. The job of your generation, I think, is to bridge those ravines. The joy of your generation will come in the creativity that comes from taking something that's in category A over here and jamming it together with something in category Z over there in the ways nobody else had imagined. My generation did this kind of mashing up in small, pathetic ways. We brought together peanut butter and chocolate and gave the world Reese's peanut butter cups. <laughs> we joined poodles and cocker spaniels to create the cockapoo. Your generation has to do a little bit better. You need to integrate white, black, Latino, and Asian. Your generation then has to jam rich people together with poor, urban with rural, New York with Indiana, conservative with liberal, faithful with secular, young with old. The assignment for your generation is to create the craziest, most beautiful mongrel mashup in human history and give us back our country. A couple of years ago, I met a woman named Stephanie who moved to Houston and noticed that there was no after-school program in a small Hispanic, Hispanic neighborhood between two freeways. So Stephanie read some books about community building and helped start an after-school program. Hundreds of kids signed up. I remember watching her playing football with a bunch of the kids and then sitting on the ground with some others doing these tongue twisters, say unique New York, over and over again. She was completely cool and completely joyful. She was a woman who'd found her life. And I remember thinking, what we need is a nation of Stephanies. We need a nation of people who find a hole in the social fabric, some place where people are adrift and unsupported, and they fill it. And so, if it was up to me and you only remembered one thing I said today, it would be this. Be a Stephanie. Be a Stefan. Find a place where there used to be community, but now there's nothing. Fill the hole. Connect people. Patch it up. Wake up one day and say, I'm going to be a Stephanie. And the rest of the problems you have for the rest of your life will only be good ones. God bless you, Butler Class of 2018.